Good afternoon. First item business this afternoon is portfolio questions on finance, employment and sustainable growth. Question number one, Alison Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to meet the opposition parties to discuss the reform of local government taxation. Minister Derek Mackay. The Scottish Government is committed to consulting others later in this parliamentary session to develop a fairer, more progressive local tax based on the ability to pay. Um, thank, you. Johnson. thank you. The Minister is aware that councils across Scotland are being forced to make severe cuts. Edinburgh alone must find £67 million of savings by 2018. Uh, this government has consistently argued for greater powers, but at the same time has disempowered our local authorities. Parents taking part in a radio phone in this morning on the need to fundraise for basic school equipment weren't convinced that the council tax freeze is fully funded. As we all engage on the debate, in we the get debate a question, please. I have indeed. On, in the debate on new powers for this parliament, is it not time to properly empower our local authorities with a fair tax to raise a greater proportion of their own income? Minister. Uh, well, I've said that the Scottish Government will work with others in terms of fulfilling that uh, manifesto commitment to put to the people, and we will absolutely do that. And to help inform that thinking, there's the recommendations of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee, which includes issues of empowerment, and of course the, uh, strengthening, uh, the Commission on Strengthening Local Democracy's deliberations to consider as well. But I wouldn't agree that we've disempowered local authorities. Essentially, the council tax freeze was supported by a majority uh, at the uh, Scottish Parliament election, so that gives us the mandate to do it. Uh, but those resources have been to, to commit to the council tax freeze, have been put into the local government to settlement to ensure that local authorities can freeze the council tax and were compensated so to do. And those figures, of course, are added to with the de-ring fencing, which has been very empowering to local authorities who have far more financial flexibility than they had before in making their own financial decisions. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. I am grateful certainly for the Minister's comments, but can he tell me how many people have actually benefited from the council tax freeze and would the Scottish Government urge all councils to deliver it again? Minister. Uh, well, of course, we would uh, encourage all local authorities to continue with the council tax freeze and all of council tax payers have benefited around 2 million households in terms of the council tax freeze. And I think this is very welcome uh, in terms of the household pressures uh, that, that would have been faced over the last few years. Now, the council tax freeze has been fully funded previously and will be fully funded again in financial year 15-16 if councils choose to take advantage of this. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Minister please advise the Chamber as to what tax options, other than a local income tax, might be considered for local government between now and May 2016? Minister. Well, our manifesto commitment is to consult with others later in this parliamentary session to develop options for a fairer and more progressive local tax based on the ability to pay. So it wouldn't be appropriate to prejudge the result of such an exercise at this stage, but all potential alternative proposals that meet this criteria could be considered. Question two, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth held with the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, Food and Environment regarding the carbon assessment of the 2015-16 draft budget. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, I've had discussions with all members of the Cabinet, including the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, Food and the Environment, during the development of the 2015-16 draft budget. The carbon assessment sets out the impacts on greenhouse gas emissions of the spending proposals proposed in the draft budget and is one of a range of resources available to inform ministerial decisions on our climate change agenda and on our financial choices. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Um, and the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the Scottish Government's carbon assessment of the draft budget highlights the issue of imported emissions. And in some sectors, such as um, health and local government, uh, that is particularly um, a cause for concern. And the proportion of emissions accounted for by imported greenhouse gases is quite substantial. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide any details of any schemes within his own portfolio or, or other portfolios that may be put in place to address the extent of imported emissions? Cabinet Secretary. The measures that we take to, for example, improve the energy efficiency of the government estate and uh, to the wider range of public buildings would be one example of measures that we take to address these particular issues. I'd also say to, um, to Claudia Beamish that, of course, 
um, uh, energy factors are very significant in underpinning these particular, the particular emissions to which she refers. And therefore, the, the, the approach of the government, both in its energy efficiency policy in general in relation to the housing stock and our approach in relation to new house development into the bargain is designed to address the very issues that she raises. And, of course, the carbon assessment has been a, a, a new tool introduced by the government to focus on the choices that have to be, to be made by ministers about, uh, yes, about financial issues, but also about the wider implications for the environment as a consequence. And ministers will continue to pay close attention to the, uh, the output of the carbon assessment tool in influencing our financial choices. Question three, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what communication it's received from the UK Government regarding the extra 100 million of funding to be available for household energy efficiency. Minister Fergus Ewing. Uh, also, we were informed of the proposed measure on the morning of the holding of a Liberal Democrat Party conference where the announcement was made and only after the press were, were informed in a release. No further information was uh, received since that date, the 7th of October, from the UK Government, despite attempts by officials on five separate occasions to seek such clarity. Perhaps stimulated by the publication of Mr Stevenson's question in this chamber, the high-level details of the amounts of the proposed funding for Scotland were eventually received from DEC yesterday. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, may I thank the Minister and congratulate myself on my success. Um, is, the, uh, is, the, is the Minister aware of WWF's uh, report on the economics of climate change policy, which shows that uh, the installation of energy efficiency measures in the UK has dropped in 2011 and 12? Does the Minister accept that uh, that drop and uh, the current incoherence of UK policy makes it more difficult for us to uh, meet our insulation of fuel poverty targets? Minister. Um, well, I, I do. It does not make our task any easier to efficiently administer a very good scheme uh, because we do not know what the budget is and what the conditions are. The scheme is reserved at the moment to Westminster were we to have power in this Parliament to administer the scheme ourselves, then we would have been able to make a start. Now we have the information, we will get on with it. And I'm pleased that uh, we have paid out on 19,670 vouchers for households in Scotland. Uh, and indeed, we spend almost 10 times as much in Scotland as in England on energy efficiency per household. Question four, George Adam. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government how many active business improvement districts there are. Minister Derek Mackay. As at 31st of October 2014, there were 27 operational business improvement districts in Scotland, and proposals to establish a number of other bids are in various stages of development. George Ad. Thank the Minister for his answer. Paisley first deadline for voting in our bid is drawing to a close. Can the Minister outline what benefits he sees a business improvement district could have for the great town of Paisley? Minister. I'm delighted to say that Paisley is indeed a yes town, and I hope that they vote yes again on the, as the bid closes the ballot on the 13th of November. Uh, £20,000 of grant support has been given as Seedcorn funding to support the bid. But I am convinced that the partnership that it will create will take forward a range of projects uh, for Paisley that will be of great benefit, including uh, retail support and outlets, the promotion of arts and cultural, historical, social, recreational, educational opportunities, more events in the town centre, and further work to locate Paisley as a serious visitor destination. I think all of that. Uh, shows how positive we can be about Paisley, as George Adams suggests, and encourage people to vote yes in Paisley once again. Question five, Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to uh, ask the Scottish Government when it last met Scottish Enterprise. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Scottish Government Ministers regularly meet with Scottish Enterprise on a range of issues. Gavin Brown. Thank you for that uh, comprehensive answer, uh, Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> According to the draft budget, um, £56 million of financial transactions uh, was removed from the, from the enterprise body's budget line for other initiatives. What initiatives was it initially planned for? 
The, the government had uh, made a prospective allocation to the uh, enterprise budget to consider uh, putting additional uh, financial transaction capability into the work of the Scottish Investment Bank. Um, when I evaluated the necessity of that investment versus the necessity to improve investment in housing expenditure, my judgment was that the propositions put forward to me by housing were uh, more compelling than the necessity of additional finance for the Scottish Investment Bank, and that is why I decided to reallocate the resources, as I indicated to Mr Brown in the Budget Statement on the 9th of October. Ian Gray. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of uh, significant and growing local opposition uh, to the Kakenzie Energy Park, uh, as proposed by Scottish Enterprise, uh, with a local petition gathering already around 5,000 signatures. Um, part of that uh, uh, opposition is driven by a feeling that Scottish Enterprise has not engaged with the local community on their own aspirations for the site. Will he instruct Scottish Enterprise to do that as a matter of urgency? Cabinet, sir. I, I, I hear Mr Gray's points, and, I, and I'm obviously familiar with this issue because he's raised these issues with me in uh, a meeting along with the uh, leadership of the East Lothian Council, which I was um, uh, delighted to, to, to host. I think we've got to, be, uh, we've got to get um, our arrangements properly in place here, and I think it's important that people understand exactly where we are with the Kakenzie site. The Kakenzie site is not in the ownership of Scottish Enterprise. Um, so, therefore, Scottish Enterprise has no site plan to disclose or to advance to anyone because Scottish Enterprise does not own the Kakenzie site. It remains in the ownership uh, of Scottish Power, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Um, so, I can assure Mr Gray and through him his constituents that should Scottish Enterprise end up acquiring the Kakenzie site before any developments are undertaken or before any developments are considered, there will be full and active dialogue with the local community. We're delighted to arrange that um, uh, directly with the local community, but we will also involve the local authority and any other interested parties in that process. And delighted to have those uh, issues discussed with Mr Gray and anyone he wishes to have those issues discussed with. Um, but I stress um, there is no active proposition in place because Scottish Enterprise does not own that site and I give Parliament the assurance that were that to happen, there will be full and wide consultation about any uses to which the Kakenzie site is put in the future. Jo McAlpine. Thank you. Can, um, can the Cabinet Secretary outline the measures taken by the Scottish Government to strengthen and support Scotland's e economic li links and overseas markets? Uh, President Officer, the, the issue of um, international business activity is central to the Government's economic strategy and as we set out our thinking in due course, um, I expect the focus that we will place on um, expanding the international connections and business activity of Scottish companies will grow ever more significantly. We are working to encourage more Scottish companies to become active exporters. Uh, we do that um, through a wide variety of mechanisms, through the account management activities of Scottish and Highlands and Islands Enterprise, um, working directly with companies to encourage them to export. We utilise a range of Scottish Development International um, offices around the, country, the, the globe, um, 28 offices in 18 countries. And the Global Scott Network um, has connected with over 1,000 Scottish companies to offer support and advice from individuals who will be located in international markets about how companies can best um, enter those markets. Scottish Development International is currently working with partners to support eight uh, to 10,000 more businesses to develop the skills to go international by 2015, and that will be the focus of much of our activity in that respect. Question six, Elaine Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how much has been spent under the non-profit distributing model and on how many projects. Cabinet Secretary. The information on the capital value of investment in the non-profit distributing programme is included in the recently published draft budget 2015-16. Liam Murray. Uh, well, the draft budget does refer to a £2.5 billion NPD pipeline and that £750 million of projects are currently under construction. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise how many projects funded under the NPD model of financing have been completed since its introduction? Cabinet Secretary. Well, well obviously, uh, well, a number of projects have uh, been completed since the NPD programme was uh, underway. Um, I don't have the complete list, so I won't give 
uh, a definitive answer to Dr Murray at this stage, but a number have been completed. Uh, she is absolutely correct that uh, there is over £750 million of activity under construction just now, and there is also £1.4 billion worth of projects currently in procurement. Uh, the Deputy First Minister at the weekend set out some further information on the, uh, a proportion of the £1 billion extension of the NPD programme, which of course will take forward a range of projects around the country, investing in the school estate, in the health sector, in the college sector, uh, further reinforcing, reinforcing the announcements that I have made previously on the £2.5 billion NPD programme. Jim Eady. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Is the Cabinet Secretary able to set out what steps will be taken to inform and update the local community on the redevelopment of the Royal Edinburgh Hospital in Morningside in my constituency, which is the single biggest beneficiary in the latest tranche of projects, with £120 million being invested in new state-of-the-art facilities so that people with mental health problems can be cared for in an appropriate clinical and therapeutic environment? Well, I am happy to reassure Mr Reedy that uh, there will be extensive dialogue with the community as the project is prepared for further development. Um, one of the elements of the NPD programme which is a necessity is that we embark on early consultation about the details of particular projects to avoid us running into uh, project management and development issues at a later stage in the process. So that early dialogue and consultation with individual communities is essential to ensure that we uh, embark on projects on the best possible basis, that they are well founded um, in uh, views w within the local community. And crucially, that the issues that Mr Eady raises about the creation of the appropriate settings for us to be able to support individuals to address their mental health problems um, is uh, well understood in the design and the delivery of these projects, which can have such a significant therapeutic benefit for the individuals who have those challenges. Question 7, Dave Thompson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on people in the Highlands and Islands having to pay a two pence per unit electricity transmission surcharge. Minister Fergus Ewing. Uh, officer, the Scottish Government is aware that customers in the Highlands and Islands face some of the highest electricity prices in the country. This is due to a combination of factors, including higher costs associated with delivering electricity in remote areas. We are discussing the current arrangements for electricity customers in the north of Scotland with the regulator Ofgem and the UK Government, as this is currently a reserved matter. We engage regularly with energy companies on a range of issues, and consumer energy bills are frequently discussed. Uh, thank you, Dave Shirt. Sure. Sorry, it's not um, Dave Thompson. Sorry. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, even uh, Scottish and Southern Enterprise are now backing national pricing uh, across the UK for these charges. And given the scale of fuel poverty in my constituency and its link with fuel costs, what more uh, can be done to alleviate the detrimental effect that this surcharge uh, has on the wider goal of eradicating fuel poverty in the Highlands? Minister. Well, we are very concerned about the uh, level of energy bills across the country, but most especially in the north of Scotland. And Mr Thompson is quite correct that his constituents in places such as Skye and La Harbour face perhaps some of the highest costs in the whole country. We are doing everything we can with the powers that we've got. Um, for example, to alleviate the fuel poverty and invest in energy efficiency, figures from Energy Action Scotland show that on average £3.52 is invested on energy efficiency measures for low-income households in England compared with £36.48 in Scotland. I think that 10 times more in Scotland than England shows we are doing what we can but we do not have the powers in this Parliament to ensure proper regulation so that Mr Thompson's constituents and people who live on our islands suffer not only the worst weather but the greatest fuel poverty and the highest bills. That has been a complete failure of the regulatory regime in the UK. David Stewart now. Thank you, uh, President Nelson. I'm very grateful. Um, is the Minister aware of the work of the Western Isles Poverty Action Group, who called to an end to the two pence electricity surcharge in the Highlands and Islands? As the Minister will well know, many consumers in the North are face facing full poverty and are facing higher fuel and transportation costs with a bleak 
and Dickensian winter in prospect, will the Minister write to Ofchem and Energy Secretary Ed Davey, urging them to get rid of the high silence of these unfair charges and instead introduce the sharing of all network costs equally across all GB consumers? Minister. Mr Stewart's remarks are, are absolutely correct and I, I do appreciate his sentiments on this matter. Uh, we absolutely believe that in the UK, Scottish householders should not be penalised in this way and they are through a total failure of regulation under successive governments. And matters are exacerbated because one of the longer term solutions to this is to connect the islands to the grid. Uh, and uh, by doing so, generate such additional benefit from community benefit and community ownership of schemes that the funding generated in places such as Shetland, Orkney and the Western Isles would be sufficient to banish fuel poverty if the island leaders so chose. So I do hope that Mr Stewart and his colleagues will join with us and make representations to the Smith Commission and use the opportunity to empower Scotland to cut our bills rather than continue with a somewhat touching faith and belief in the goodwill of the Tory government, their former Better Together allies. Jimmy McGregor. Uh, thank you. Um, I agree with the ministers um, saying that uh, due to the relatively colder weather, um, constituents in the Highlands and Islands face greater fuel poverty and um, they're understandably very concerned about the transmission charge. Now, SSE has indicated it wants to see a national price has the Minister raised this with the Competitions and Markets Authority, as well as the UK Government? And if so, what was their response? Minister. Well, I would expect that action from the Competition and Markets Authorities would be akin to expecting a chocolate fire guard to operate effectively in this matter. <laughs> We've got the regulatory authorities off, Jim. They don't work. That is the problem. And there's another problem which, sadly, Mr McGregor's colleagues and masters down in London haven't dealt with, and that is this. That in Scotland, we, we have 35% uh, of the costs in the whole of the UK of transmitting electricity, but we only have 12% of the generators. So they're paying three times as much for, for transmitting electricity. And of course, they pass that on to their consumers in the Western Isles, in Skye, in Loch Haber, in Shetland, in Orkney. So I urge uh, Mr McGregor uh, to look at other options to solve this not least, powers in this parliament. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. And the minister did start off rather well in his initial response to David Thompson's, but it's kind of degenerated ever since. The Scottish Renewables submission to the Smith Commission has emphasised the need to retain a single energy market across the UK, uh, the only way of spreading that cost. You will be aware that my colleague Sir Robert Smith raised the issue with Dermot Nolan, the uh, Ofgem CEO yesterday uh, in Westminster, whereupon Mr Nolan indicated that the idea of a single national tariff, as we have for Royal Mail, while complex, uh, would be possible. I wonder, in the discussions he's had so far with Ofgem and the UK government, he might be able to indicate uh, what progress has been made in those discussions. Well, well um, we, we have been discussing these matters, presiding officer, with the UK government, with Ofgem, uh, uh, for as long as I can remember, and for far longer than I've had the honour of holding this position. Indeed, it's the First Minister who has been leading the campaign on this issue and called for fairness of electricity costs throughout the UK. Project Transmit was supposed to be the solution to that, but that solution is not expected now to deliver any amelioration of the unfairness to Scotland until 2016. So that is what the regulators are doing at the moment. The regulators are responsible to the UK government, and sadly, the regulators just have not delivered. Question eight, Fiona McLeod. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the latest figures on manufactured exports in Scotland. Minister Ferguson. So we welcome the index of manufactured exports increase of nearly 3% during the second quarter of this year and continue to work as Team Scotland further to promote exports. Can I thank the Minister for that response and can I say to the Minister, am I right in thinking that this trend could be continued and ever strengthened if the Smith Commission was to recommend that responsibility for all business taxation and employment law should be with the Scottish Parliament? Minister. Uh, yes, the Member is absolutely correct. Uh, I, I pay tribute to Scottish exporters. They are doing extraordinarily well through their own efforts and the, the quality of their goods and products uh, and through the good offices of uh, 
SDI, SE and HIE. Uh, but it is, of course, vital that we have access to all the levers over taxation. For example, if we were possessed of powers in respect of air passenger duty, then according to the leaders of most of uh, Scotland's airports, we would be in a position further to increase uh, travel and thereby help to promote and stimulate trade and exporters and welcome more people to Scotland. So the member is absolutely correct in calling for more powers to come to this Parliament on these matters. Question 9, Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact exiting the UK would have on the Scottish economy. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the Scottish Government firmly believes that ex exiting the European Union would have a deeply damaging impact on Scotland's economy. Europe is a vital market for Scottish businesses, accounting for 45% of Scotland's international exports, worth £11.7 billion to our economy. Analysis published by the Centre for Economics and Business Research in March 2014 estimated that in 2011 around 336,000 jobs in Scotland were associated with exports to the EU. Such jobs and economic activity in Scotland would be at risk if the United Kingdom was to leave the EU. Christina McKelvey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for um, explaining those risks to us? The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that recent polling shows that while people in Scotland would vote to stay in the EU and a referendum people across the UK would vote for an exit. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me and now Carwin Jones, the Labour First Minister in Wales, that this underlines why it is essential that the UK exit from the EU must require a vote for that in each of its constituent nations of the UK, thus ensuring the economic interests of all of the nations of the UK family are represented? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I, well, the point that uh, Christine McKelvey makes is the, is the argument that was advanced uh, by the Deputy First Minister. It is a strong argument to indicate the importance of Scotland's uh, position uh, as part of the family of nations that we were told existed uh, within the United Kingdom is properly represented and now of course that this view has um, been amplified by the comments of the uh, First Minister of Wales yesterday. Uh, I think it's important that this whole debate is taken, um, uh, taken forward uh, as part of the consideration of what I think would be a foolish move by the United Kingdom to leave the European Union. Question 10, Mike McKenzie. To ask the Scottish Government how it's taking forward the proposals in empowering Scotland's island communities. Minister Derek McCann. We are already working with the island councils and other key stakeholders to implement those parts of our prospectus for the islands uh, that we can with our existing powers, including, for example, in relation to aquaculture, the rural development programme and island beef producers. With a further transfer of powers, for example, over the Crown Estate, we'll be able to deliver more for the aspirations of the islands. Mike McKenzie. I thank the Minister for that answer. He will have seen today's uh, publication of the submission, submission to the Smith Commission from the island, three island authorities, which are calls for, amongst other things, local control of the Crown Estate, devolution of 100 per cent of Crown Estate revenues, powers to ensure islands can benefit from renewable energy, powers to ensure lower electricity and fuel costs in order to tackle fuel poverty and direct representation for the, for the Scottish Government in Europe and devolution of welfare to the Scottish Government. Does the Scottish Government support that position and would he urge all those in the Smith Commission to take account of the views of the islands in their deliberations? Uh, yes, I would concur uh, with those comments. I have had uh, sight of the Our Islands, Our Future submission to the Smith Commission. Uh, not in full detail, but it looks to me as if there's much alignment with the Scottish Government's position. And in terms of the consensus that could be reached in this Parliament, if Labour's true to their word in terms of the empowerment of the islands and what they wanted to do with uh, the islands, and the same for the Liberal Democrats and others, then maybe there are enough members of the Smith Commission to produce a robust package for the islands that will be able to transfer powers to this place and then uh, in turn allow us to transfer uh, powers and further decentralisation and subsidiarity, that principle, to local islands. So I think there's a great opportunity across the parties to support the vision as outlined in the prospectus we offered to island communities. Question 11, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to increase employment opportunities in the west of Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, Scotland offers the most competitive business tax regime in the United Kingdom and the Scottish Government is delivering a range of initiatives to create jobs and attract inward investment. 
This is Gateway and Enterprise Agency support to start up and expanding businesses encourages job creation into the bargain. This includes RSA awards, which in the west of Scotland totalled £29.6 million in 2013-14 and £22.5 million in the first two quarters of this year. With half the 2014-15 remaining, the anticipated jobs created or safeguarded by these RSA awards represent 82% of the 2013-14 total of 4,131 jobs. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. And, uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that, uh, that in Inverclyde and Western Bartonshire uh, they have seen a dramatic loss in uh, manufacturing jobs over the last three decades due to, in the main, the UK Government policies. However, with the vital role that the Scottish Government has actually undertaken in stepping in to help save Ferguson shipbuilders in Port Glasgow, it demonstrated that areas in the west of Scotland actually have a manufacturing future. Therefore, what further assistance can the Scottish Government provide to encourage further manufacturing opportunities, either by existing companies or by further inward investment, to, to places like Inverclyde and West Dumbartonshire? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Officer, the, uh, the, Mr. Mr McMillan uh, rightly refers to the important news that we had over the summer of the, um, the, the, the rescuing of the Ferguson shipyard. Um, it has been a, a source of significant joy to me that we were able to bring about um, a resumption of manufacturing activity in that yard and to protect shipbuilding on the Lower Clyde. Um, th that was one example of the government working collaboratively with our enterprise agencies, with the local authority and with other interested parties in ensuring that that was able to be achieved and that approach will be deployed on any other occasions that we feel it necessary. The Scottish Manufacturing Advisory Service also offers a very specific amount of support to individual companies who are wishing to develop their manufacturing activity, and that will be available to companies in Western Bartonshire and Inverclyde uh, to meet their requirements. Question 12, Mark Berge. To ask the Scottish Government whether it considers that local authorities should have the power to begin pursuit of tax debt up to 20 years after the liability arose. Minister Derek Mackay. Uh, under the legislation governing local taxation, responsibility for the administration and collection of local taxes lies with local authorities. It is for each local authority to interpret and apply the relevant legislation when seeking to recover local tax debts and to decide how best to seek payment of outstanding local taxes. However, the Scottish Government is aware of concerns about ongoing pursuit of historic debt and therefore intends to bring forward legislation which will mean local authorities no longer have the ability to collect debts from the defunct community charge. In doing so, it will ensure that local authorities are compensated in line with the current collection rates in respect of outstanding amounts of community charge, poll tax, which would have been collected. Uh, a constituent of mine has shown me what appears to be a tax demand for council tax from 12 years uh, before the, the date of, of issue. And it strikes me as a, a, an area of concern that councils can, uh, under the current powers, do this and that individuals essentially have to be able to prepare and provide records stretching back uh, over a decade uh, on receipt of a tax demand. Uh, can the minister give any indication whether, as well as the issue of the community charge, the wider question of the duration of time over which uh, these tax demands can be made will be considered in the process of the legislation. It should be clear that the First Minister's intention, uh, as outlined at First Minister's questions, is what the government will legislate for. We will we'll carry out what has been, we've committed to publicly. But I'm happy to see if uh, government officials can assist uh, Mr. Biagic, with the specific points around legislative burdens, because there are clear burdens and uh, legislations around prescription uh, and uh, Limitation Scotland Act 1973 in terms of the timescales in which uh, debts can be pursued. But there is a difference between the poll tax liabilities, most of which are now out of reach technically uh, anyway, and council tax debts, which there are far less of, fortunately, in proportion to the poll tax, uh, by nature of the two different forms of taxation. But I'm more than happy to provide further guidance to local authorities to ensure there's clarity on both as we go forward with that legislation. Question 13, Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact air passenger duty is having on Scotland's tourism sector. 
Minister, fair be sure. We believe uh, air passenger duty is one of the most damaging of taxes to Scottish tourism, making it much more expensive to visit Scotland than competitive destinations. We welcome the submission made by Edinburgh, Glasgow and Aberdeen airports, which supports transfer of power over this tax to this Parliament. PMD. Thank you. I thank the Minister for that answer. I wonder whether he would agree with me that APD is contributing to London airports being log jammed with flights rather than actually facilitating direct flights here to Scotland. Minister. Well, I think we don't really have a UK aviation policy. We've got an aviation policy designed for the needs of London, and that has long been thus. And the difficulty is that to boost tourism, we need to make it easy and affordable for people from foreign countries to get here. Travelling by air is the gate to Scotland. Since air passenger duty in the UK is by far the highest of any major country in the world, the UK effectively plays a padlock on that gate. Question 14, John Lamont. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what analysis it has carried out of the impact of the recently announced land and buildings transaction tax on domestic and non-domestic property sales in the Scottish borders. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government's proposed progressive rates and bans for land and buildings transaction tax will ensure the tax charge on 90 per cent of residential transactions and 95 per cent of non-residential transactions will be lower than or no higher than the current SDLT charge. The average price of a residential property sale in every local authority area in Scotland is significantly below £325,000. The value which the tax charge under land and buildings transaction tax um, is lower or, when this, or, or the same as the SDLT charge. This redistribution of the tax burden will support the majority of first-time buyers and complement this Government's commitment to support ownership, home ownership in a balanced and sustainable way. In the most recent quarter, the LBTT charge on the sale of the average residential property in the Scottish borders would have been £1,055 lower than the current UK mm. tax charge. John um, well, I thank the Cabinet Secretary um, for that reply. But the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that last week, Registers of Scotland published data which showed that the average price of a detached house in the Scottish borders was over £250,000, meaning that many properties in the borders will be caught by the Government's new 10 per cent tax rate. What analysis has been carried out on whether the housing market will be skewed before and after the new tax is introduced as sellers desperately try to avoid this extra 10 per cent tax rate? And is the Cabinet Secretary concerned that this will result in the long-term lower tax receipts? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the first thing is that I, I, I don't really think the Conservative Party are in a strong position to complain to me about any factors that will happen in the market between the time of my announcement and the start of the financial year, given that the Conservatives were arguing that I should have announced the tax rates much earlier than I, in fact, uh, set out the uh, tax rates and tax bans, as I did to Parliament, several months in advance of the start of the financial year. Now, um, quite clear, uh, Mr Lamont highlighted the fact that the average detached property was um, of the, 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 the level that he said, and, which is still below the £325,000, which means that um, uh, there will be a very substantial number of detached properties selling in the Scottish borders, and the cost of uh, the tax charge will be lower than it is currently within uh, the arrangements in Scotland. And, of course, the average house price in the Scottish borders is 160, or in the last information I have available, £165,762, uh, which uh, that's the figure for April to June 2014, um, which, of course, um, is very significantly lower than the £325,000. And... I think Mr Lamont needs to think about the encouragement of the property market in the Scottish borders. And I think what all the evidence I'm hearing is that the property market in the borders and throughout Scotland will be strengthened by the fact that I have substantially reduced the cost of acquiring a property for first-time buyers and for people moving up the next stage of the housing ladder. And I think that will be warmly welcomed yeah, to Lincoln Bridge of Scotland. Thank you. That ends portfolio questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 11395 in the name of Elaine.